Hello, this is Judd Vance, Bonding with Board Games. I'm here to review France 1944, the Allied Crusade in Europe Designer Signature Edition, published this year, 2020, um, with Compass Games, designed by Mark Carmen, and I'll be upfront, developed by yours truly. So if you're saying, hey, you're biased. Okay, Mark Herman. I'm already probably <laughs> darn good chance I'm going to love the game already, but... Um, before this predecessor, hmm, this game again came out in 1986 with Victory Games. Um, I gave the game a 10. We did a ham tag video of our top five solitaire um, games. And I didn't have as many ambush type of games that you play solitaire. So I was going more and I was playing lots of vassals. So I wasn't doing a lot of solitaire. But I put this one on. Um, mainly because I couldn't get players to play me on Vassal, that this was my favorite solitaire game. So I loved the game long before I got on board with this. I'm going to just kind of give a little overview at the beginning, uh, set up at the beginning of, of what goes into a game turn in this. Um, at the start of the turn, and on game turn one, you skip a lot of the beginning because it's already set up for you, but I'm just going to show you like if you run game turn two. Um, there's your turn track. Each player would have one, or if you're, I had this set up for a solitaire setting where both, where you're doing both players at once. You go down here, and it tells you um, these are your replacements, which is a different part of the game on um, administrative phase. But you're going to see how many supply points you get, and you would slide your marker up or down. I mean, up, always up, for how many supply points you're going to gain that turn, and your reaction points. And I mentioned that. Like in this case, which isn't going to happen on game turn one, when the allies capture the V1 sites, if they have done that and not um, the Brittany campaign, uh, Brest and St. Nazaire, you'd flip this marker over so you'd see your reaction points you get for the allies are uh, three for turn two, and you'd say, oh, I get six. It's just a reminder, mnemonic. So there's different reaction point markers to remind you. Um, so you do that, and then you'd roll for if you get air, air support. It's automatic on the first turn. Next one you need to roll, it's one to five. If not, your units, you'd flip them to the unavailable side. This is their available side. Um, now, all this is skipped because your startup already has your first turn supply points, reaction points. You go straight to how many supply points you're going to commit. Um, so for the allies, what this is going to be is, Every supply point you commit next turn, not this turn, is how many chits you're going to throw into the cup. So let's say the allies say, I want to commit two. They take their supply point committed and move it up two. And then the Germans, they only have one, so they're going to commit it. And then the next turn, you're going to gain supply points, and then you're going to look at your committed take them back to zero, and then throw that many chits in the cup. On the first turn, the Allies have two chits, the Germans have zero. Um, <clears throat> so, with that in mind, that's the intro. So you skip everything except the supply points committed. Remember, you're playing those a turn in advance. So, um, there, like I said, there are two Allied chits in the cup to start with. So you draw one, hey, I got the Allies. The first thing you do, you've got these tracks. Now, this is a pretty cool idea in this game. Each one of these represent a, a, a how am I going to say this? An interval of time, and they're all equal. They're divided into increments, and there's six different, or sorry, five different paths to go down. So if I start here, this rep, let's say that I'm just throwing this out because it's kind of arbitrary. Let's say that this represents a week. If I do this, this part represents a week. If I take this path, I'm going to have to go down. Maybe this represents four days, three days. Maybe this is four, two, and one, one, two, something like this. Anyways, start to finish, it's the same amount of time. It's how many sub increments you want to show in this. Um, and it's supposed to, it's kind of coming close to resembling real time, or not res real close, but it's an attempt to break the increments down instead of this is not a movement phase and a combat phase. I move everybody up, I do my 
odds calculations soak off and we have a combat. No, you're moving, you're fighting because this is going to capture how the armor units were on the had them on the run and fighting them in the open. So you pick one of these paths. I'm gonna player pro tip for you. Be careful. Think it through a little bit. It's not um, analysis paralysis time. Um, I can tell you right now, you start right down this path because that's this is the one that's going to be awesome, and you'll see why. Um, for the opening move, it gives you lots of lots of punching power, and they're named uh, set piece attack, counter arms offensive, armor breakthrough, things like this. But what you're going to do is pick pick one of these five at the top, and you're going to start down that path. Now, when you place it down, you have to decide: is this going to be a movement increment where our units can only move? Or am I going to do ones that only attack? I'm going to go on and put this here before I activate my headquarters because I know what I'm going to do. Otherwise, you'd activate it. I'll show you. I'm going to do an attack increment. Okay? Um, and what this means, when you see the 2+, plus, that means anybody with a movement factor or 2 or more can attack on this increment. If it's blank, you can't attack. You don't have the choice. Okay? And then there's parts up here about if you're choosing movement, that's what this is for. But I'm only going to do the attack right now. So I'm going to place my marker here. Now, I'm going to slide it over and bring the game board down. Now, what now when you draw the chit, the first thing you would do, actually even before laying your marker down, but I didn't want to go back and forth with these boards too much, afraid I'd mess something up, is you're going to pick a headquarter unit. And it has to be in supply, and trust me at this point, there's no supply problems for the Allies. They've got an easy path to the sea. Um, it has to be in supply, and then you activate it. Um, that number on the side of the headquarters is telling you that any unit within six hexes that you can trace without going through enemy unit hex um, is you can activate any of those units within the rules of nationalities or the limits I should say. Uh, that's found right here. US headquarters can only activate American units and French units. You might recognize that that was the basis used in Empire of the Sun, a very similar system. Okay, so you pick that, you flip it over, and it tells you you can activate five armor units and five infantry units. If you're new to the game, you might want to get those activation markers out. I'm going to show you how to do it. You pull out five of each, and I'm going to use the magic of time travel to place them. Okay, I placed them down there to show you that I am activating these units and I put an admin move, that's like a strategic move marker because he's not going to be able to attack anybody, he's not adjacent to anybody. I just had an extra marker, might as well use it. Um, and, um, okay, so I have the arrow showing who they're going to attack. Now, this it's counter clutter, don't get me wrong, but if it helps you keep your thoughts straight, and this is really where you get where you might need it your first game to open. I'm going to remove these and simplify it a little bit, show you a couple of tricks I use. Okay, so this is just representing all these guys are activated. I don't really have to worry about showing. They can only attack this hex because they're not going to attack their own guys. This one here, I just push the units over on the hex side they're going to attack. You know, so I, I wouldn't even use this. I just put it down there to show you. Both of these are going to attack here. These two units are going to attack here. So the first thing you do now that you decided you have an attack increment going, Nobody can move, so this guy can't do anything. Only you can only, and you're not required to attack. It's your option, and, but you have to be an activated unit. So like this U.S. infantry here cannot join in on the fun. Um, so the first thing you decide is, do I want to, as the attacker, and only the allies have air power? Do I want to add any air power in? The rule on this is you can use one strategic bomber per chit. Means. And it's only a one-time use. It's going to be gone after this. You throw it in the box, you're done. If you want to use it, that's fine. That's why I didn't put both bombers out, because I'm only showing this first increment. Um, so you can do that, or you can use tactical. You cannot use both in the same increment. And when I say increment, I am talking about this. This is one increment. This is an increment. This is an increment. All three of these make up the initiative phase. And there's other paths. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to confuse anybody. Okay. So, yes, I will add, it's not necessarily a smart move. I think that's what I did in the playbook. Hint, hint, don't do this. I'm going to add him into there. So, um, 
That means I cannot add the tactical to my other combat hex because this is one increment. I'm going to use him. I'm going to throw him in the box. He's done after this. What this means, this minus two, is <clears throat> in set piece combat, he's going to knock two off the enemy morale. If he's in mobile combat, on the run, he's not going to do anything. Whereas a tactical unit does, tactical air does minus one in set piece, minus two on the run. Makes sense when you think about it that way. Um, so each side has to pick a lead unit. I'm going to run this combat first, obviously. So the Germans is pretty easy. He's got this one unit. That yellow four is his morale. So he has a base of four. Going to lose two off of it because of um, the air unit. If you go to the player aid chart, look under morale effect, and this is for set piece combat only. Um, he's in rough terrain. So he's going to gain one. The defender is going to gain one. The attacker is going to lose one. So you have four minus two plus one. His morale is three. So keep that number in mind, three. I'm going to pick um, one of these American units. I'm going to pick this guy to be the lead. He has a morale of five. If you go to the same terrain, like I said, he's minus one. So his is four. So four and three is the morale. Next, these two numbers, nine and three little tiny if you can see them it's a s for set piece m for mobile at the start the very first attack of a turn is always set piece mobiles when you're on the move and what that means is the units attacking um how do i say this you knock the enemy out you advanced after combat the next increment has to be the next one you follow up with another attack that's why i was showing you that path you're going to want to take and i'll, I'll demonstrate it some more so um if you do that, you're in mobile combat. You'll notice infantry are great at set piece nine, only three in mobile combat, um, where the armor are three in set piece, four in mobile combat. The second number shown is the movement rate. Now, like I said, back over here, anybody with the movement of two or more can attack. That's everybody. Your movements are two, four, six in this game. And you lose one if you're out of supply. So... With that in mind, you'd add up your combat factors only using the set piece. Um, I'm not going to do the math right here in my head, but I know it's 3 to 1, and that's really the magic number you're looking for. So he's got 3 to 1 on here. Both sides would then roll their dice, and I'm just going to throw something down there. Um, you're going to take one of these special dice and your regular D6 and roll them at the same time. Now, the D6 is going to tell you, did you pass your morale? The German was three, so he has to roll a one, two, or three to pass his morale check. Um, the Allies are going to have to roll a one, two, three, or four with theirs. So that's a big part of the battle. Did you pass your morale check? And then this is your base damage, one, two, and three. And then that's going to get adjusted. So let's say, I mean, I could roll it, but these dice are going everywhere if I do. Um, let's say each side took two hits and, uh, both of them passed their morale check. Here's how you use this. Actually, I should have showed you this earlier. Um, set piece combat. This, this would, might help a little bit. Um, so if, if I'm the attacker, if you have an H at headquarters that is adjacent, you're going to add three to your set piece strength. That's supposed to represent the artillery. Then you have morale modifiers, and I said go to your train effects chart, and then you're going to roll. Okay, they both passed, so he had a successful attack. Now the defender over here, the headquarters is going to add three strength. I should say for the attacker, it says in there that it has to be the active headquarters. This can be any headquarters. It's going to give you three strength. You're going to use your morale, and then it says tactical errors minus one, heavy bombings minus two. You come up with your total morale number. They both succeeded. You have failed, successful attack, success, failed attack. You cross-reference them. So you have a standoff. Since it's set piece, you're using the black section here. The attacker, you look at your odds. It's greater than 2 to 1, so he's going to subtract a hit. So he had two hits. Now we're down to one. Then for both sides, you're going to look at the train attrition. When you go to the back, set piece combat rough is going to add one there it is attrition modifier plus one to the attacker minus one to the defender so he had a base of two 
minus one for the odds, minus, uh, sorry, plus one for the train. So he's going to take two hits. First has to come off the lead unit. So you, so I'm going to flip him and I can, now he has another step loss. If I, I mean, each of, each of these are three step loss units. If I want to apply both to him, which wouldn't be a smart move, I'd put the cadre marker on him. Cadres have no zone of control. There's, there's, uh, and they have uh, one for their attack. I mean, for their combat factors. Um, so um, I take one there, and it can come off of any of these units that participated. I'm going to take it off of this guy, just being arbitrary here. So there's two. The defender had two. Now the defender. Um, there was greater than three to one odds for the attacker. So he's going to take an additional hit. That's three. You go to the train modifier, which is minus one. So three, sorry, two plus one minus one. He has two hits. Ouch. He's a cadre level. However, it says defender must retreat. This is this yellow means it represents both mobile and set piece. If they pass their, if they fail their morale, they have to retreat. If they pass their morale, they have the option of voluntarily retreating and taking one less step loss. So I will choose that one and retreat. You have to go um, and you follow the retreat rules on how that's going to work. And the attacker can then has a choice of, I mean, has the option to pursue. I'm going to get these things out of the way because they're bugging me now. Okay. Sorry, I played this game too much. Um, so. The way this works is infantry can move into the hex, and if they're in an enemy zone of control, they have to stop. The armor can keep moving. Otherwise, you can move two. So if that guy wasn't there, he could have moved in two. And this guy. So they're all going to move there. Then I would run the combat over on, and this guy's gone. You throw him in the box, you're done with him. You can't use him anymore. I'd run the other combat. I cannot throw my air marker in there because in this increment, I supplied um, a strategic bomber. Now on turn one, you do have two tactical markers. Um, but on turn one, there's a restriction that you only get one of them on turn one. On turn two, I could, if I would have foregone the bomber, I could have placed one tactical marker in each combat. You cannot put two in it. So you can, you know, each tactical is a minus one on your morale. You can't add two of them and say, oh, it's minus two. One per battle hex. Um, but like I said, restriction on turn one, so you only have one of them and I cannot use it. So I'm going to arbitrarily run and he took some losses. This guy had a really great die roll, so he only took one loss and he's digging in. Okay. Um, the point I want to make is now we're done with that we're part, done with that part of the increment so we go back to our chart now at this point you have a choice of any of these three paths if you do this uh, let's say i wanted to go here it's only a movement there's no number in here so i have to choose the movement option right up here um, i'm going to bring the other card in and hopefully we can get focus This tells you that if a unit has six of their base movement on their marker, if they're if they're using standard movement, they can move. They can spend four movement points. If they're on administrative, uh, sorry, yeah, administrative move, which is that unit I had at the top, it's a strategic move. You get double that. You can never move adjacent to an enemy doing that. There's restrictions, um, but. This game does not have what some games have, that you can always move one hex no matter the movement cost. Um, there is a movement uh, train effects chart telling you how much it costs to move into each one. If you fail to have enough movement points to move in, and there are penalties for moving out of an enemy zone of control and moving in. So if you move out of one and into another, you're going to add them together. And I get, this shows you in the rule book. You can get pretty extreme on some of these movement costs just to move one hex in those situations. So when I, so you want to be very careful in how you plan out which one of these paths you're going to take. Because you don't, oops, I forgot that. Can I redo that? Your opponent's probably not, dude, that ain't cool. Um, it's one of those life lessons you'll learn. You get burned on it a couple times, you'll start to figure it out. It's a lesson you'll learn once, very difficult. But I want to show you, you could take this movement path and 
over here the difference is Where over here, the guy had, if he had like an armor with six movement, he can move four movement points. If he takes this path, he can only use one movement point because he's going to get to keep moving. Um, and like on this one here, you have the choice. Either units with a six movement, which is armor, can battle, or if they're moving, they can move two. Uh, spin, sorry, move, spin two movement points. So it's your choice. That's how that works. Um, I'm going to choose this one right here because I want to keep fighting. I have the choice. I can keep moving or I can keep fighting. If you, Like I said, if you have the number in here, you have a choice. If you don't have a number in there, you have to choose the movement option. So I'm going to attack, and that four means anybody with the four movement or more can fight. Okay, so I bring this board back down. These guys um, down here, um, they could renew the attack. C has a movement of four, so any of these guys could continue attacking him. Uh, or these guys could join, and I could have everybody jump in on This is not a game where eight to one odds is better. Three to one is kind of the magic number. You'll tell that by looking at the card. Um, but I'm I want to show you how this mobile combat works. These guys are going to attack here. Okay? And they're still activated for the until I run out of spaces to move that marker down. They're activated the whole turn, but they want to attack him. Now the rule on mobile combat is if you moved into that hex, the previous increment, and by increment again, I mean I went from here to here. Yes, I did an advance after combat, so I am on the move. If I paused and didn't move him and then tried to renew it, such as I went down this path. I moved into it, I paused, and then I wanted to attack. I'm back to set piece. Too much time has passed. They've had a chance to dig in. But I've got them on the run. I moved directly into that hex. They're on the run. I'm using mobile combat. Um, now, the only time mobile combat happens is when that happens and you're in the open. Or there's a special rule that if you moved into a town, what that represents is you ran into the town, but you didn't have time to dig in. So you're kind of on the outskirts of the town running. But otherwise, if you're moving into rough terrain, um, think forest, things like that, it's set piece automatically. And the rules are really clear on that if you check it out, if you have any questions. But he's in the open. I moved into that hex. We're in mobile combat. So now, do I want to supply air power? Oh, yeah, because we're on another increment. I could do this. And if I attack again on the next increment, I can reuse this piece. You could use these up to three times um, in, a in a single um, initiative, you know, with your chip pull during the whole time. You can use it, reuse it, and reuse it, and reuse it, and reuse it. The only restrictions are one per combat hex, and you cannot use it if you committed air uh, strategic um, bombers on that. So we're going to mobile. This guy only has one mobile. He's reduced infantry. These guys, four, two, and three, um, he's nine. So he's nine to one odds. Um, going back to the chart, oh, you pick your lead unit. I'm going to pick this guy right here. For the other guys, I'm going to pick this guy here. So he is five. And um, <clears throat> let me show you this air power because this has a pretty cool. It says minus two plus one. What that means is if you're in mobile combat, the first number set piece, I'm in mobile. He subtracts two from the enemy. He adds one to you. So this guy is a six. There is no terrain. You can look it up. There's no terrain modifier in the open because um, those those modifiers only apply to set piece. Um, so when you go down here, you're on mobile combat. The attacker is going to add one for tactical air. So he's six. And there is no, if I roll a six, it's an automatic failure. He's automatically going to pass this one. The defender is at one. There is no adjacent headquarter. Um, actually, yeah, there is. My bad. Um, so yeah, there is. So he's going to He's going to add three to his strength. So he's actually at four. So what do I say? Nine to four now. Okay, morale modifiers. He's not out of supply. Minus two for tactical air. So he's at three. Minus two, he has one. So it's six to one. He's automatically going to pass. So when you go over to the attack, he's going to be in one of these two. He's probably going to fail. And that's a retreat. Um, is the odds greater than two to one? I think I said it was nine to four. Uh, nine to four. So yes, two to one. So the attacker's going to reduce a hit. The defender's going to take a hit. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm on the wrong section here. 
Um, three to two is the magic. Yeah, you're in the gray section, my bad. Um, so yes, attacker's going to reduce a hit, defender's going to take a hit. That's another sweet thing about morale is you don't need the odds as high. I'm sorry, in mobile combat, you don't need as high of odds. Um, and because he failed, the defender must retreat. There's none of this reduce, um, reduce a step loss by retreating. You have to retreat and you don't get that bonus. Um, so he's probably dead in all likelihood. You're going to roll your dice and add your hits to it. He's already adding one for the odds. So he's probably dead. He probably failed. I'm not going to roll the dice and have him scatter everywhere. And then they could move into that hex. What you'll start noticing is on the next chit pull, which will be an allied, you probably want to hit with the British. And you can start trying to work, I hope I pronounce this right, the Fallays pocket. You can start trying to trap the Germans. Well, the thing is, is after I would do this, I would do this. Sorry. Um, I would come back, renew my attack, probably get this guy beat up pretty well move this marker down. I want to take this one so I can stay on the mobile attack because he's in the open. And then I want to attack here, see if I can disperse that headquarters or and or move in. And you can start to see I'm working the encirclement. So I've got this part of the pincher working. The British on the next chit pull, if they pull, they can only activate British units and I can do a bomber. Over here you got a lot more of the armor. So the British can start to activate units and they can try to work the encirclement. But after I have went through all of these, that ends my initiative. At that point, it then goes to the German, or the defender, I should say. And if that player has any reaction points, that person has the option to spend reaction points. And if they do not, it goes back to the attacker and the attacker can spend them. Now what you do with these is you can spend one point to activate one unit, or you can spend three points to activate a headquarters and activate a lot of units. Okay, so why would you want to spend a reaction point? Um, there's two reasons why. First of them, one of them is to get a unit out of harm's way. If these guys start getting encircled, you can try to pull them out. Um, Another one, um, or just to move units up, fill holes, stop breakthroughs, things like that. But another one, and this is big, is the only time you can move a headquarter unit is, it doesn't matter, you know, if I pick a movement increment, during when I do the chit pull and I'm moving, you can't move headquarters. The only time you can do that is during the reaction phase. And I say I spend a point, and if you spend three points to do a headquarter activation, you don't get included. It's your, it's your typical chit. I flip it over. I activate a bunch of armor and infantry and go and go do my thing. You don't get a move headquarters. You have to spend one point to move a headquarter or two points to move a headquarter and another unit or two headquarters. And you pick one of these headquarters. Sorry, he's on the wrong side. He has six movement using base movement. Um, you'd want to put the admin move marker on him so he'd get 12 and it becomes strategic movement. He gets 12 movement points, can never move adjacent to an enemy. Um, but what happens is, since these guys, this guy only has a range of five, these guys start, you know, kicking rear and they're moving way out here. This is what happened. Patton ran so fast across France, he outran a supply and then he had to stop and wait for him to catch up. Um, so that's what this is, that's what this is catching in this. So it's also, like I said, um, why the allies are really want to get peel off a few units and go get those spots in the Brittany Peninsula and why they want to take those D1 sites out because that is like getting free movements and or free chits to put in the cup without putting them in a the cup it's like and at the end okay after all the chits have been drawn then you go into a reaction I mean everybody gets a reaction um, each player so if you're sitting there saying oh, I didn't get a chance to properly use or you want to wait until the end then everybody gets a chance to spin reaction points, one, two, or three. Each, each player does it just once. Um, and if I didn't say it before, I want to emphasize. The Allies started, they drew their chit. The Germans have a chance to react. If they do, that's it. You draw the next chit. If the Germans pass, the Allies then have a chance to spin reaction points and go again. Um, do either move units or flip a headquarter and activate a bunch of units and keep attacking. It's never a case of the allies pull their chit, 
the Germans did their reaction and the Allies get a chance to react. No, if the Germans, they can spend one point and twiddle their thumbs. They're not obligated to do anything. But if they spend even a single point, the Allies do not have a chance to react when their chit is drawn. Same with the Germans, uh, the initiative player, the reaction player. Um, so that is how that works. Now, when you have the admin phase, I'm not going to go much into that. You would you would pause, you would go down, you would look at how many replacement points you get, and it like here it says uh, U.S. armor and infantry three each, uh, other allies two and two, and you have to be nation specific on that, and you can flip. For, so three means you can flip three steps. You can bring units back from the eliminated box, but units in the eliminated box are considered step one with a cadre marker on it. So if you want to bring them back to full strength, you've got to spend three points. Um, this really captures that the British units are powerful, but they're fragile. So they don't have near as much ability to replace, and the, the Americans are able to replace armor a lot more. But it does become a grinding battle of attrition. You've got to be careful how you use it. But you would do that. You look at the reinforcement chart and place your reinforcements, and um, then you would you have a chance to do a strategic movement on those reinforcements and bring them out, the units you just placed, so you can get them up to the front a little more quickly. You check your supply. You check your supply at this point, and also when you attack, you check the defender and see. Now, one of the things I want to point out, just to be clear, and it's in the rules, is if, if I'm on the edge of the headquarters range, my unit that I activate, he punches somebody in the mouth and starts chasing him and he's out of the range, it doesn't matter. When you start that first increment in supply, you're in supply for the rest of the increment. So, but it's when you start, you can't, you cannot activate a unit that's out of your range. Um, so anyway, so that's, that kind of gives you a little overview of what the game's about. I didn't cover everything. I didn't cover the special rules for Battle of the Bulge and Market Garden and how airborne units work. Um, that's all in the rules. I just wanted to give you just a quick overview because this system is pretty darn unique. You catch parts of it, you realize it was the foundation for parts of Empire of the Sun. Um, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview for this. If you want a little background on the story uh, on this thing, um, the game came out in 1986, Victory Games. That's my like all-time favorite publisher. And this is before I found out Mark Herman ran it. I didn't even know who he was back then. Just loved their games. And this thing came out, and Mark said it sold about 13,000 copies, and it was the lowest-selling game ever of Victory Games. As commercial disappointment, I think he said. Um, different theories. Mark said it's because it's too light. It's, it is really light, 131 map, 130 pieces. Um, and people equate value with weight. One of my theories was that the game is simple and only plays in about three hours and if you looked at the victory games back then they were big and complex and you know there's a thing about your audience maybe they're like eh, you know I like big games I want little games I don't know um, but um, since he was running the guy since he was running the whole thing it probably disappointed him I'm guessing a little more as the head honcho um, more than just a designer who didn't have a monster hit but um, beside all that, um, I got this game in 2011, secondhand store. And for me, it was I flipped it over, and because I love victory games, but boy, they are beast. Um, a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of them are really big. And I flip it over, I was like, what's well, the complexity level? Is this going to be Gulf Strike, which I do love, but it's off the chart for complexity. Um, no, hey, it's low complexity. Hey, solo, solos will. Actually, the solo rating is way lower than it should be. It should be super high. And um, is it a... I was like, well, this is pretty cool. I like this. It plays in three hours. Hey, that's cool. Um, so let me go read about this. It said designed by Mark Herman. I'm like, okay, yeah. Because by then I'd played We the People, Washington's War, and he was my favorite designer, so it was a pretty easy choice. I played this game. I love it. I drop him a line because, hey, For the People's been remade. Um... What else? Um, oh, Wash We the People slash Washington's War. And I'm like, whoa. So I write him, and this is before he knows I'm crazed. Um, <laughs> so I write him, and I said, hey, the, um, I said, this game is awesome. I never even heard of this game. I said, is this thing, can you get this thing reprinted? And he's like, nah. 
So I write him, I don't know, a year or so later, and I make a reference to it. And I was like, you know, I'm the patron saint of lost causes. I said, I'm trying to get the whole world to convert to the Dvorak keyboard. I'm not going to rest until this game's remade. And he's like, well, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but no, it's not going to happen. So we shoot the ham tag video. And it starts getting on some people's radar. I'm not patting my own back, just some people watched it. And I noticed generally prices would go up. As I said, Greg killed W1815 for me when, because price went to the roof after that. Um, but then John Kranz got on board. Um, I don't know exactly the timeline, but when he did, it started gaining traction. And I saw on Mark's blog um, that he was working on something with it. And I was like, whoa, cool. In 2018, he drops me a line and says, hey, you got any I, you know, he's had some upgrades he wanted to make to it. He said, do you have any ideas on improving? I said, oh, yeah. Mainly the opening breakout and some of the layouts of the charts and stuff could be made better for solitaire players. So I, I start play testing it, and he likes what I'm doing. So he makes me, so he asked me if I want to be a developer. And I was like, I don't even know what a developer does. He's like, well, it's what you're doing right now. I was like, cool. Um, so that's, that's how that came to be. Um, so, what I wanted to cover on this um, is basically, would I recommend it? Well, yeah, of course, but why would I recommend it? And if you, one of the questions is, if you say, I already have this, why do I want this? I'll lay it out there. I'll tell you why it was for me. If I, hadn't, if I didn't have a free copy for being the developer, and I'll tell you up front, I'm not making any money. I'm not associated. If this thing sells a million copies, I'm not getting, I'm not getting a dime of it. Um, but... Um, if let's so say if the uh, if I had this, why would I want this? Well, if I didn't, if I had this and I was just a fan or whatever, I knew that yeah, I would still buy this. I would, uh, and I don't upgrade very many copies of my games. Done a couple usually through trades, but this is one I would definitely go for. Um, so why why would I? Uh, first, the components. Um, some people like mountain maps. Some people like paper. I'll leave that to you to decide. Um, I think the maps a lot better looking. Um, it's a lot less uh, with that intense brown. I think it's a lot easier on the eyes to look at. I think it's a lot easier to read. I love that it goes deeper into Germany. Even if you never get the Russia 1944 game that, that'll be its own game, or you can tie them together and do a Battle of Germany. We talk about it in the extended unboxing. Um, it's, it's, I like the map a lot better by itself and that it gives you more options. The counters are a lot slicker. Um, the combat system, so much better. Um, the old one was you would do your force ratio and your terrain and get an odds, roll it. It would give you a number. You'd have to go to the other chart, cross-reference that against the attacker and defender morale, and it would have a letter. Then you go down and read it. It was kind of a pain to work with. Um, it wasn't the worst thing. I've had far worse games calculating combats, but it was it was kind of tough. And um, he did it so much more smoothly with a simple die roll and a and a matrix, and it tells you everything. And trust me, after a turn or so, you'll have that thing pretty well memorized. Um, it's so smooth and play and does it so much, kind of like what Washington's War did to We the People. It's the combat system just made it go so much more quickly. Um, so that was there. I love the added Chrome. There was nothing in the original game that ever made you want to go do the Brittany campaign. Um, other than take that unit out or just keep somebody on guard so he doesn't come and take out your supplies at, at Normandy. But there wasn't anything there. There was no V1 rockets. That's all in there. The original game had a Battle of the Bulge special rule and a market guard. And this one adds um, pl Plunder Varsity, another airborne drop in Germany. Um, rules about that. So there's added chrome and, you know, like I said, more terrain, more options, just a more robust big game. Um, not big as far as more difficult to play. It's just as hard to play as the other one, uh, which is not a difficult game at all. So, um, like I said, the combat's much more improved and the, the, the chrome's also improved. Uh, the solitaire experience is vastly improved. Yeah, that was me. Um, because I focus, you know, when I started playing this, I was a big, big, big vassal player, running, you know, 10, 15 games at a time, way too much, don't ever do that. Um, but I went more into solitaire, spending time. I just wanted to study what the game was about. And hey, if I'm a terrible player on both sides or one side, so be it. I can learn something. If I screw up the rules, my opponent doesn't mind. <laughs> um, but... Um, 
I just started getting into playing more of my stuff solitaire. And the layout, you know, as a solitaire player, and if you all play solitaire, you know what I mean, you want a small footprint. You don't want a game. You're always reaching across the table. You have to get out of your chair, go look at a chart on the other side, or you have to turn to, in order to get the, the charts, the tracks or whatever right, you have to turn the board sideways. Now you're always crooking your head, looking weird, at it weird, which was in this game, the, the original one. <clears throat> It wasn't laid out to be solitaire, but if you think of the 80s, it was a lot easier to find two players um, to play games. So the whole solitaire experience is set up. Small footprint, easy to get it out there and play it without a lot of moving around. You can sit at your kingdom, you know, and I have it all here within reach. Um, and as a, somebody who does this ex almost exclusively, the whole game is designed from the solitaire aspect with that. Um, also... You don't have to go back, hopefully, you don't have to go back to the rules as much because we really went deep on um, mnemonic markers and trying to make it as easy as possible to set up. And once you get the rules, to stay out of the rule book, or if you just have to reference a rule, easy to find, easy to reference other sections. You read a section, it mentions something else, there's a reference to it. Um, very minimal use of acronyms. I only use HQ and ZOC because I assume headquarters and zone of control. Some all war gamers know I hate acronyms, so you don't see them. Um, so I tried to make it as easy as possible because I was going off of all of the frustrations I've ever had at learning games. Um, now, if you're the kind of person who dives into a game, I think Mark Herman had this cool phrase. He told me something about the best games don't reveal their, their secrets on the first play. Um, so um, this is definitely one that's not going to do that. Um, but if you're the kind of player that's going to jump in and play it 100 times, um, you won't have any problem with the rules. But I know a lot of players play a game once or twice, put it up, come back, visit it later. So I tried to make it to where you come back and relearn the game if you know it. Watch a video. I made a video, gave it an overview, set it up to where you can just go right to the sequence of the game and play it. Um, so you just go right to where you're at, boom, there it is. Um, hopefully. Uh, give me feedback, by the way, because I, I worked really, 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 really hard on those rules trying to get them just so. Um, by the way, if you ever write rule books, if you can get hold of Greg and get him to review your thing, guy's got an eagle eye for stuff. He's, he's, off. He's, he's crazy how good he is. That's kind of the improvements. That's why I, I'd say it's worth upgrading or getting. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of other things on this. If you look at the um, the comments on the game, the original game, there was some complaints about the combat system. And if you look at those comments, they're usually older comments. Um, and it, it was really what it was, was it was so different that from everything that we'd seen before. Um, in the 80s, you know, force ratio, terrain modifier, I've got um, 29 combat factors, you've got 10. We're at 2 to 1 because we always round down. Oh, but you're in terrain, so it shifts at one, one direction. Oh, we're at 1 to 1 now. Oh, if only I could bring this brigade in. and Oh, that'd get me up to 2 to 1. And my attacker eliminated goes from 1 to 2 to 1. And that system, he flipped that on the end. And I think it blew people's minds. And I wanted to talk about that for a second because um, let's just talk about it. Okay, first of all, when it, the Mark Herman's design process, and this isn't any, I'm not giving any insights away from working with the guy. He said this on podcast before. Um, and it's not, no, it's not because I'm tapping his phone or anything. Um, he's a voracious reader of books. Hope I use that adjective right. Um, just reads and reads. He doesn't walk around. I'm Mark Herman. I read every book. But if you just talk to the guy, you figure out he reads a lot. And his recall is off the chart. I compare it to that scene in Goodwill Hunting. If you haven't seen it, go YouTube Goodwill Hunting bar scene um, where Matt Damon like totally owns that yuppie dude. I mean, when you just talk to him, he doesn't sit there and go, yeah, that, that dude with the beard and the long hair. What? Boom. I mean, his just just in casual conversations, man. He, and, <clears throat> you know, I gave him a book when I was out visiting in New York I, and it's about Battle of Alaska. Uh, and I asked him a question a couple months later about Atto and he started explaining, he said, oh, that was not that book you gave me. Like just, he just, he just, he just reads tons and tons of books. But my point is he'll see something in a book and think that's pretty cool. 
I'd like to do a game and look at this aspect of it. Because if you think, I mean, he learned from the hand, I mean, he learned from Ducat himself. That's a Babylon 5 reference. So for all my B5 friends, yeah. If you haven't watched it, it's great. Best show ever. Anyways, Jim Dunnigan. And I'd caught this on one of his podcasts. I'd done again and told him, um, try to get as much of your history filtered through about three mechanics and shake the rest loose. You, you know, you're working on an aspect. You're not trying to create the end all, be all, do all perfect simulation. You can't do it in a game. It's impossible. And the problem young designers have is that they are so into their topic. They want everything in there and they make a game that's unwieldy or unplayable, or just not particularly fun. Um, give a shout out to Mark Mazicki on Red Winter. Man, he he, you can tell he loves that topic, but he made a game that just nailed it perfectly, the aspects. And it's like, you just don't see that too often. Mark Herman, on the other hand, been at this game for, what, 40-some years? I think he's designed like over 70 games. Um, he knows a thing or two about this. He's got this process. So he reads, he says, I want to make something on this. So, for example, um, Vietnam. He wants to. He wants to look at the interaction of the four factions. So, um, you know, he ends up hook, getting with Volko Runke because there's already mechanics out there that do this, and they get fire in the lake. He just wants to look at that aspect of the Vietnam War. That's his emphasis because you can't cover everything. Nick Hart couldn't do it with Vietnam. I mean, it's a great game. It's huge, but it doesn't cover all the aspects. And a more practical one late recently is when he was reading about the Yalta conferences and the Big Three and all that, and he just wants to make a game that covers those. There's no mechanic out there covering it, so he invents one and does Churchill. And that's his thing. He doesn't start with, oh, I come up with this, you know, this edgy, cool mechanic. Let's see if I can apply this. I don't know, the Civil War. Can I? You know, he comes up with what he wants to explain and model. And if it's there, he'll use it. And if it's not, he'll invent it. So when you hit this game and he's reading about Cobra and the breakout and all, I don't, I mean, he's, he's covering different aspects specific to this. And some of these aspects that he models in this game and invented new, new mechanics to do so was the activation system. It's not, you know, in the old days, it was, you had movement phase, you had combat phase. You don't have that. You have both at the same time because you had you know, Patton's chasing him across France, just smacking him silly while he's chasing him. You can't get that when you move, stop, bring in your infantry and fire. You, you need to show one system where the armor are really great when they're in pursuit and the infantry are a lot better when they're in set piece. So you have two combats in here, set piece and movement on each one. And then you have to catch the, the uh, mobile combat. He had to break the, each turn phase into increments so he could show the armor's constantly on the move um so he ends up and it's something similar to um, you know it's not real time if you're being a math nerd delta x is approaching zero but it's still quite a far away from zero sorry i just do that i'm it's, it's how i roll um but you know he's creating these increments to capture this he also there's a well-known game on cobra i'm not going to mention or talk about it. i'm not even criticized got a great rep but one of the problems i saw with it is that everybody moves and that wasn't true um you know you had supplies the allies had overwhelming supplies but they had longer supply lines to get it up there and then you know the phrase praise rob from peter to get to paul rob from Monty to get to Patton. you have to decide who you're giving the resources to and he captures that when you activate a headquarter and then everybody in that range, nation specific rules. Patton's not going to activate the British and Monty's not going to activate the French. So that's captured in this system. Um, also, the, when, you know, when Patton ran so fast, he had to stop and wait for the supplies to catch up. You have that in the game. You actually have to pause and take you know, you actually have to plan on how to get your headquarters moved up so you can continue your assault. Um, so he creates this whole system for this. And, you know, you probably recognize the headquarters system he used it in Empire of the Sun later on. I mean, it's the basis. It's not exactly the same, but you can you can definitely, that's what blew me away when I saw this. I saw this kind of, dude, Empire of the Sun system. Um, so um, now the combat system, what he saw, because there's many you know, people grab this isn't how it is, and you know, and what the, the thinking is is 
you know, all things being equal, four infantry brigade, uh, four infantry divisions are four times better than one infantry division because you know your combat factor captures the quality and the the weapons you're using, that kind of thing. But not really, because there's two things. First of all, is a million to one better than five hundred thousand to one, or are you just kind of dead? <laughs> you know, nine to one, eight to one, seven to one. There comes a point where you get too many and you get in each other's way and it's not as smooth of a coordinated attack. You also can't count on coordinating all those units at once. So yeah, more isn't necessarily better and it's definitely not proportional. So he has that in there that yes, there comes a point where more is better, but then there comes a point where more isn't better. And that went against everything we thought in the days of the old Avalon Hill system. I mean, hey, there's a limit. You can't go more than anything beyond 8 to 1 is considered 8 to 1. But really, it's not that. And also, all divisions are not created equal. If you've heard the Civil War phrase, and you'll see in the elephant, battle-hardened troops are going to be better than green troops. And America sent a lot of green troops into Europe at that time. And if you're a battle-hardened veteran and you're on defense and you've got the terrain, which is represented in the morale system, you know when to pull back. You know when to dig in. Um, you're going to be better at this than green troops. You're going to know how to make, stage a more effective defense. Just like if you're a battle-hardened, you're going to know how to attack better. And you've got your lead unit leading it. And can they stand and take the, take the punishment to help everybody else, or if they split and run, you know, like you see in the old Civil War, ah, they all run and everybody else starts running. Um, you're catching, you're capturing this. And by putting almost as much emphasis in one way as, on morale as just the force ratio terrain, he kind of turned it all on its head and it just blew people's minds. Oh, this isn't how, this isn't how it's supposed to be. Well, something to consider is you know, like I said, this guy reads like crazy. He has, and he has it all. If you ever really hit him up for it, he'll give you all of his sources of where all this ideas come from. Just keep it open that maybe he's read more than we have. Now, not everybody, I'm sure, you know, and there's probably generals and stuff that know more and things like this, but he has read it and it's not, he just didn't pluck it out of the air. He based it on some stuff. Now, whether you like his sources or not, or say, well, this source disagrees with this source. Okay, that's up in the air, but he just read, he read his stuff. He wanted to model something and he did a dang good job. Now, if you don't like it, that's, that's up to you, but realize it wasn't just random. It's based on something and he wants to model that and it came out beautifully and kind of when I look at his games I look at what's he trying to do and did he do it now some games I like better than others because um, you know fun fun's very um, opinion based but um, you know some of the stuff like wow he really did a one heck of a job modeling the, this thing he's trying to go for the other thing to realize is that that's not a unique system I don't know if his was the first to do it. You, somebody smarter than me with history. I mean, Greg probably knows a lot more about this. Mark Herman, other guys. I don't know if this was the first game to use a twin system with like morale or place that emphasis on it. But it has been used, this concept. It's not necessarily the same way, but it's it's seen again. I'll give you an example, two examples, actually. If you ever played the GMT games, uh, Mark Miklos, American Revolution, they use force ratio and terrain, but then there's a morale of a lead unit. So you might be the Americans with a three to one ratio advantage. And, oh, I'm awesome. Your lead unit's a militia with minus two. The defender and lead unit's a grenadier with plus three. You're subtracting five off of your, uh, off of your roll, on, off your D10, and suddenly your odds kind of suck. So that morale was factored into that game. It's nothing new and it makes perfect sense. It might make a little more sense than that. And I do admit that the, it wasn't as intuitive in the old game as it is in the France 1944s is in the new game. But the same idea, another one's the area impulse games, the, uh, the operational level ones like uh, Turning Point, Stalingrad, Breakout, Normandy, Monty's Gamble, those kinds, where you might have one unit in defense and some pretty good terrain. And I have three units attacking. I don't add, and you, you're going to dice off with 2d6 to see who's going to roll higher, but then you add stuff to it, and it's combat factor, terrain, but you don't add all the attackers, only the lead. Same with the defense, only the lead, and then you might get, you know, your lead unit might be 6, and then plus 1 for every fresh unit you add, because they're not 
double, triple, quadruple your attack and overwhelm, they help, they give you an advantage, but it's not proportional. So these concepts aren't anything new, but it, I think it just blew people's minds in the 80s. And now that we're kind of on a new level of gaming, uh, a lot more stuff comes out more frequently, a lot, you know, a lot of fresh ideas we've been coming out with in the last 20 years. Um, I think people are more open to it. But I just wanted to say that if you look at the combat system, and one other thing, I don't remember if it's in the design notes. Um, you think I would know, but I don't. Um, by the way, in the design notes, he does mention my fanboyness, so that might be worth <laughs> that alone worth reading. Um, but um, anyways, the he there's something if you go to the original this game on BGG, go to the files. I don't know if he did it on Consim World or on a blog or what, but he wrote. What he should have put in here, this is the last mistake Mark Kerman's ever made in his life back in 86. There, I had to give a fanboy shout out there. Um, that he didn't put the designer notes in that one and talk about why the combat system was the way it was. But he published it somewhere, somebody grabbed it, turned it into a Word document, I don't know if it's a PDF or not, um, stuck it in the file section of that game on BGG. Highly recommend you read it if you have any doubts. But it followed his design philosophy perfectly for what he was wanting to model, and he nailed that thing, knocked it out of the ballpark, in my opinion. Um, so, anyway, so is the so in kind of summary is yeah. Why would I recommend the game? Well, first, it's a blast. Second, it, it's all the things. It's solitaires. There's when they did this when it first came out. I'll tell this one. It came out. Um, I looked at the box back, and it said solitaire rating eight. And I wrote John Kranz, I said, why? This is a 10, there's nothing hidden. And he said, well, we'd like to reserve 10 for games like, I don't know, the Peloponnesian War by Mark Herman, Ambush, games that you're playing in AI. And I said, well, that's fine, but why do you even have a nine rating? There's nothing hidden. I said, I'd recommend putting this thing in a nine and then put in parentheses, no hidden information. I said, don't give people an excuse to not buy the game saying, well, I'm gonna have to, I'm a solitaire player and I have to bridge the gap and you know if i'm playing a card driven game i i have ways i do it but it's never as perfect as playing a player so he's like yeah that's a good idea so that's why it's a nine and says no hidden information better make sure it does or everybody's gonna laugh at me um yes ha 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 no hit yes okay sorry just got the game last night I haven't checked the box back out but um anyways so if you're a solitaire player nothing's hidden but the chip pull gives you randomness it's it's a lot different, you know, as chip pulls do. They give you, so you never know, quite know what's coming next aspect to it. Um, so it also gives you a lot of chances to try out different strategies. It's not going to reveal its secrets on the first play. You don't have to play it 50 times or be like me where I've never figured out the secret to chess. I'm going to say I'm going to brag that I'm one of the five worst players on the entire earth. Um, the game, you'll figure it out. First time you play it, You'll make mistakes and you'll realize, oops, that's my pro that's the games I like where I see them say, Oh, I could have done this better, I could have done this better, and then the second time I play, I get a lot better, but I still made a couple of mistakes that were critical. And you know, the third, fourth game I'm able to able to play, you know, everybody except maybe the best WBC champ, you know, and get in there and hold my own. That's that's how I like them, and you're gonna get this. And if you have any doubts on how to run the it's usually involved with how you pick your um and it how you pick your track on the initiative. Um uh, which initiative path you're choosing, things like that, running the combat. And that's why there's that intro scenario on the fall of France. Just run it over and over and over until you feel pretty confident. Then jump to the market garden, try it. Then when you really feel like you got this down, you're ready to go. You know, you can either try bridging the Rhine or going all the way, um, conquest of Germany scenarios in this. Um, so, you know, like I said, it's, it's not super deep where you have to play it you know 100 times to figure out what to do you're going to figure it out pretty quickly but you're not going to figure it out all, all at once um, so there's a lot of depth to it you can try broad front strategies narrow front strategies in this it's hopefully if i did my job on the rules it's an easy game to learn and an easier game to reference like it's, I, if i haven't said it please give me feedback because i just really want to know um and plus, I tip some dude 50 key gold because he loved my rule book. Um, I got tons of the stuff. So if you're desperate, let me know. Say something nice about my rules. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, and the game doesn't have too long of a playing time. I think uh, I think it's about four. If you want to play with the bigger scenarios, it might be four. It's a, it's a single setting game. And hey, if you have any problems with the game, message boards, geek mail me, uh, 
Twitter. Um, if you ever check me out on Twitter, you better like the Sixers because if you hate the Sixers, you're going to hate my Twitter account. I've um, got to give a shout out to my boys. Um, but uh, any of that stuff, you know? So tons of support on this thing because this, was this wasn't just a game. This was a passion. This was like a crusade for me to see this thing get reprinted. So now that it's here, uh, you know, I want to make sure everybody else sees what I saw in the game. Why? I don't know. Ego or something. I don't know. Call it what you want. But I just wonder, you know, that if you remember the old 70s commercials with the Coca-Colas, I want to teach the world to sing and perfect harmony and give them a Coke. I want the whole world to play France 1944. Oh, that's so awesome. Mark Herman's the ultimate. Um, then you all think I'm, quit thinking I'm a weirdo. Um, anyways, so. No, that won't happen. Won't? Okay. Just saying, that was a funny reference. Yeah. Uh, it popped in. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that is France 1944. If you've never played it, you want a great game on Cobra. Beautiful game. If you have it, I would recommend upgrading it because I think you will like it even more. Um, and that's I just not enough good things I can say about this. Um, that's just another I, the crazy thing is Mark Herman does so many great games. You know, if it's most designers, I'd say, yeah, this is the masterpiece. I don't know. I always think Empire of the Sun's his ultimate masterpiece, even though Washington War's been his my opus. favorite. Yeah, I mean, he just makes so many Churchill, Pacific Wars. Like, dude, just cranks them out. Like he's I don't know the Beatles or something. <laughs> I still got to play Empire of the Sun with you. I have it, but it scares me. South Pacific. Start with that. Okay. C3I. It's, it's really, it's pocket. It's pocket version of it. Got it. Uh, okay. All right. Sorry. Go, going off on a tangent there. Fear. Not that I haven't done that today. Um, all right. Anyway, so that is France 1944, the Allied Crusade in Europe, published by Compass Games. And let me compare weight. Oh, my God. Yeah. This must be better. <laughs> Bonnywood Board Games, Judd Vance. I just popped in. Okay, Chief. Oh.